Uh, hi, I'm Rachel White. I'm the interim president of the New America Foundation, and it's a pleasure to welcome everyone here tonight. We're expecting even more, um, so as people come in, they might be jostling for seats a little bit. Um, I want to thank our partners on this event, uh, McDermott, Will, and Emery, who made their beautiful space available to us. Uh, Politics and Prose, our bookseller, who are sitting out in the lobby awaiting your uh, book purchases uh, after the event, if you haven't purchased one already. And of course, Random House, uh, without whom none of this would have been possible, um, not least publishing the book. So thank you to everyone who helped us make this possible. Um, it's really an honor for us uh, to host this event for Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen for their really important and timely new book, uh, The New Digital Age. Uh, Eric Schmidt, if you're not familiar, is, the, among other things, the chairman of the New America Foundation. And, you know, um, in a place that's about uh, new ideas and fresh talent, he's, he sort of embodies it from the top of the board, and it goes all the way down to the junior staff. Um, it was actually a couple of years ago, I remember now, that um, Eric came into our office and kind of casually gathered some fellows and staff and bounced some ideas off of us, received a little feedback, said he might be writing a book, and uh, two years later, it's, it's just an honor for us to put that book alongside the book of our fellows and our staff up on our bookshelves. Um, Bob Wright, who's moderating tonight, is a longtime uh, New America person. Um, he's been a Schwartz Fellow. He's now a Future Tense Fellow. He's the author of several acclaimed books, um, among them Non-Zero and The Evolution of God. He's um, one of the smartest and funniest people I know. Eric and Jared, you're in terrific hands tonight. And Jared, um, I want to take credit for, because this is Washington, and I should take credit for everyone who's standing up on the stage. Um, and I'm not sure that I can, but I'm going to do the very best job I can. Um, I'm going to say that it's, it's an accident of timing that Jared neither worked at New America or was a fellow there. He's, he's the director of Google Ideas and was a member of the staff at the, director, uh, at the Office of Policy Planning at the State Department. He worked for Anne Marie Slaughter, our incoming new president, when she was director of policy planning, and he was succeeded by Emily Parker, who took his job and is now a fellow at the New America Foundation. So, you know, really, um, one way or another, he'll probably come and work for us eventually. Um, but until then, we're going to take credit um, for his talent and his ideas, which we surrounded all along the way. Um, a few housekeeping notes. Right after this, we're going to go up to the roof. Um, it's a beautiful view, and that's where the wine and the food is. So you'll want to make your way up there. We are live webcasting this event, so um, keep that in mind. And, um, and don't forget to... Uh, <laughs> Don't, don't forget to buy a book. Thanks so much, and welcome to our speakers. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you, too, for writing the book. I've learned a ton from it. Um, and uh, I mean, I haven't read it, but I've listened to the, the audio <laughs> version, and that's, that's probably close enough. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was surprised by, by one thing about it. Um, generally, when you, know, you have a book that's authored or co-authored by a captain of technology, you know, Bill Gates, Eric Schmidt, somebody, you expect um, a lot of technology evangelizing, you know, a lot of stuff about the wonders of technology and how glorious everything's going to be. And there's, this book has you know, a number of upbeat places. Um, but it, it also, you know, parts of it are kind of scary, unsettling, dark, this stuff about, uh, you know, a, a perpetual cy low-grade cyber war being uh, the likely expectation, um, you know, the, uh, the, the um, how technology may facilitate the kind of online persecution of minority groups, stuff like that. So, um, you know, I'm just curious, first of all, Eric, I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to ask you whether it's an optimistic book or a pessimistic book, because then you'll say it's a realistic book, right? So let, let's, let's skip that part. But I'm curious, um, you, it's been out long enough for you to have gotten you know, some feedback. Are you, how are people characterizing it along the upbeat, downbeat spectrum, and are you surprised by that? Well, you know, when we, when we sat down to talk about this a few years ago, we weren't quite sure where we would end up. I guess I learned that's how books are done. And we ended up with a generally optimistic view of what's going to happen as five billion people join the conversation, if you will. Um, that the wiring of the world, which is going to happen in the next five years, another five billion, we already have two billion, we can take you through why that's going to happen, is an unalloyed good. It's extraordinary with respect to uh, medicine and education and security and so forth for many of these people. And we should be very, very excited about it. 
Uh, we also are quite optimistic about technological innovation in the short term here in the developed world, and we have examples of that in the book as well. But we also got into some pretty serious possible outcomes because not all governments want everybody to be empowered. Um, not all citizens are honest and effective and wonderful and clear and transparent and not lying. And you put all that together and you end up with, depending on a sort of a, the way you read the book, uh, either you conclude it's an optimistic book with a whole bunch of scary stuff, or you just conclude it's a scary book with some techno-optimism. Uh, but I think from our perspective, and I think speaking for you, Jared, as well, um, we think that this is an overwhelmingly good set of things that are going to happen, and there's a set of issues that are quite bad that we need to get organized about to address in okay. cybersecurity, governance, balkanization of the Internet, terrorism, privacy, security, the usual favorite subjects. Okay. Well, and if, I, if I could just add one, one piece to this, part of it is when we sat down to write the book, uh, we were somewhat tired of this debate around is technology good, is technology bad. It didn't, one, seem that prescriptive. Two, it didn't seem to account for the inevitability of the five billion new people connecting. And when you look at where they're coming online, it's parts of the world where there's conflict, where there's instability, where the governments are reasonably autocratic, sometimes very repressive. And our view was let's have a responsible and honest conversation about the good and the bad that awaits us, because we don't believe any of the challenges in the future need to be intractable. Uh, and if we don't actually have a willingness to talk about them, how are we supposed to figure out ways that we can address them? And so that's why we talked about the good and the bad. And we have a, a, a funny kind of bias, which sometimes doesn't work in Washington, where we think actually ex the existing zero-sum solutions in society can, in fact, be solved by technology. And so we try to identify the ones that can be solved, but we also recognize that it creates some new ones. Okay, good. Now, I, I do want to get some of, to some of the part that I consider uh, kind of grim and depressing, but I want to start with something that, is, <laughs> that uh, will strike uh, most people as, as quite the opposite. It's one of the sunnier parts of the book, also uh, one of the more vividly futuristic. I mean, this, uh, this part makes the, uh, the Jetsons look like the Flintstones, I would say. Um, and, and it's about... Uh, 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 it's about people in our demographic, you might say, um, a, a few decades hence, um, and, you, and you sketch how a day might proceed. Okay? An average morning might look something like this. There will be no alarm clock in your wake-up routine, at least not in the traditional sense. Instead, you'll be roused by the aroma of freshly brewed coffee, by light entering your room as curtains open automatically, and by a gentle back massage administered by your high-tech bed. <laughs> I'm totally on board so far. <laughs> You're more likely to awake refreshed because inside your mattress there's a special sensor that monitors your sleeping rhythms, determining precisely when to wake you so as not to interrupt a REM cycle. But I guess if you want to remember your dreams, you can do it the other way, where it wakes you during the REM cycle. And if the dream is bad, you can have that memory erased, presumably. Well, that, that may be another decade or two out. That's a good idea. <laughs> um, yeah. I, you just attribute it to me, and I, you can make as much money off it as you want. Okay. Your apartment is an, elect, is an electronic orchestra, and you are the conductor. With simple flicks of the wrist and spoken instructions, you can control temperature, humidity, ambient music, and lighting. You are able to skim through the day's news on translucent screens while a freshly cleaned suit is retrieved from your automated closet because your calendar indicates an important meeting today. You head to the kitchen for breakfast, and the translucent news display follows as a projected hologram hovering just in front of you using motion detection <coughs> as you walk down the hallway. Okay. Um, First of all, I should say, I think my job tonight is when you guys are being sunny, try to rain on your parade, and when you're seeming too downbeat, try to, try to pick you up, okay? So let me, let me, um, let me complain well, no, about this situation. No, but, but the fact of the matter is everything you just described yeah. is either in development or available today in technology. And you think the average person will choose to use it all? It's entirely up to them. It's a consumer mm. society. Uh, personally, I would prefer to be woken up at the correct part of my REM cycle. I would, I, would go for, I, I would go for dream interruption myself. Uh, and maybe that's why you're rich and I'm not. Uh, but my, my dreams were not interrupted and yours were. Yeah, yours, 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 yours were, yeah. Your, yours were realized and, and mine remained uh, vivid dreams. Um, but I'm totally over that. I'm, I'm not bitter. I don't hold it. Um... But actually, I do, it, you said it's a matter of choice. And here is, here is something that um, 
that maybe kind of bothers a person like me, okay? It's this hologram hovering in front of me as I walk down the hallway, okay? And, and filling my head with information um, as soon as I get up. What, uh, the, what kind of bothers me is the pressure is the pressure to make use of it whether I want to or not. You know, later uh, in, this same, in this same scenario, you, you talk about how I'm, you know, you're about to interact with foreign clients through automated translation. You say, you take another sip of coffee feeling confident that you'll impress your clients. Well, I'm only confident if I've used that hovering hologram to learn as much about, right? If I haven't, I'm toast and my competitor will impress them and I won't. I mean, there is a, there is a serious point here, right? This is a metaphor. <laughs> okay. Um, the, when, what happens when you wake up yeah. in the in the future is the system around you will adapt to the problems you have at hand, and the next generation of computers, and they, this is all opt in and with your permission. And if you don't like it, you can turn it off. Is going to anticipate what you need to know, anticipate what problems you are, and help you be more efficient. Mm -hmm. In that sense, the sort of duality of what do computers do well and what do humans do well will become fully realized. It's important that these, these examples that we use, which are a speculation, obviously, um, are really about making you more productive. There is an off, bu on, off button in all of these scenarios. Right. And because you're a sophisticated consumer and you've decided to opt into these things, if it doesn't work, not only are you going to turn it off, you're going to send it back to the manufacturer. OK. I mean, I guess what I mean is they're, they're, you, you almost, I mean, so many of these things are competitive assets in your profession. I mean, you almost have, like in my business, Journalism, no choice but to do Twitter, which I, I kind of like Twitter, actually. But if I didn't, I'd still have to do it. Which is well, but there's going to be an explosion of these new AI systems of one kind or another. And there's going to be huge competition from new firms that haven't even been found, founded to try to capture your attention to solve the problems you, you, that you have. Most people would prefer to have an infinitely intelligent assistant that organized their mm. phone calls, their problems, told them what issues they had to become familiar with, and then figured out how to answer questions so that they could actually have a little bit more free time. When you put it that way, I'm warming up to it, actually. Okay. An infinitely intelligent assistant. Um, OK. Uh, so uh, privacy. Um, you, you, uh, that, that's a place where I got like mildly freaked out. You, you, I mean, the idea seems to be uh, you'll live more and more of your life online, um, and so more and more of it will be recorded. And you, you put a little emphasis on how hard it's going to be to expunge any of it, right? The mm -hmm. difficulty with actually deleting data. Um, is, is, uh, are, are most of us underestimating how easy it is to escape? I mean, is the scenario right where just... You know, I, you might as well assume that everything, you know, a, a higher and higher percentage of my daily behavior will be on the record forever. Well, yeah, I mean, it, so l let me make one point before we, we get into the, the details of your question, which is when we sat down to write what, in essence, is a full chapter on the future of privacy and security and your identity, we made a deliberate decision to look not just at the first two billion people who are already connected to the internet. We wanted to really understand how are the next five billion people going to think about privacy and security? It turns out when you go to places like Myanmar and Libya and Afghanistan and Pakistan, there's really very little, if any, distinction between those two concepts. And we came back with this profound sense of uh, the, 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 these two topics being deeply intertwined. And you know, we, we argue at, at Google and, and, and personally as well as in the book that it's the ultimate shared responsibility. Everybody has a role to play. Obviously, companies need to put tools in the hands of users that uh, safeguard their privacy and security and make it easy to understand how to use those tools. Governments have a role. Uh, but what we really focused on is the role of the individual. Now, one of the things that I've been shocked about is parents put sonograms of their, their, their children mm -hmm. online, which means that your identity actually starts before you're born. Um, and this is actually the direction that, that we're going in. And you know, I give that as the extreme example of the best way to safeguard privacy and security in the future is to start earlier and younger than you can possibly imagine. So we've talked to parents in every single one of the 30 countries that we've been to together. And our view is parents need to talk to their kids uh, about online privacy and security years before they talk to them about sex, years before they talk to them about the importance of staying away from drugs and you know, responsible use of whatever else. In fact, one of the themes that, that you keep bringing up, Jared, is that teenagers and physical maturity has always been an issue in society, you know, terrorism and young men and all that kind of stuff. And now all of these tools are becoming available to very, very young people um, who will, in fact, make mistakes, for example. 
and those mistakes will allow them to be apprehended by the police if they're doing something evil. They also may make mistakes that they're going to regret when they've grown up, and parents have a very important role to play in both. And of course, you and I have been talking about this in the context of, of terrorism specifically, which is we've been arguing there's a long tradition of young people making mistakes. And if you think about <laughs> who most terrorists and criminals are, uh, it's going to be the same in the future as it is today, which is they're largely uh, young people under the age of 30, maybe a little bit older. So two things will not change. Terrorists will still be young, and terrorists will still make youthful mistakes. The difference is they're going to have technology, and so the room for error goes up. Uh, the digital trail uh, exists throughout their mistakes, throughout their sort of responsible interactions. But either way, mistakes get documented, and the plot has a better chance of coming unraveled. OK, so speaking of terrorism, um, now, first of all, you wrote a book about terrorism called Children of Jihad. Is that right? Based on your travels in the Middle East and elsewhere, I think. Um, and there's a, there's a part of the book where you describe using the online world, using smartphones, actually, to make people less likely to become terrorists, right? I mean, uh, youth who might be disaffected and in danger of going that route. And what we know of the Boston bombing suggests that, that disaffection was, uh, was part of the process. Um, can you talk about that a, a little? Well, if you think about the old model in which young people were, were radicalized, they were in a back alley religious madrasa. Uh, they were in an environment where uh, the only information they had was rote memorization through the only teacher uh, who, who, who they interacted with. In an era where Afghanistan comes online, Pakistan comes online, all of Saudi Arabia comes online, everything changes. Uh, every single environment where individuals, and particularly young people, have mobile devices gives them an opportunity to challenge rote memorization with critical thinking. Gives them an opportunity to challenge violent, radical ideology with critical thinking. It doesn't mean that young people won't still become radicalized. Terrorism is going to continue well into the future. But the ability to plant a seed of doubt in communities is going to be easier than any other time in history. And options and choices at the end of the day are our best chance of diverting at-risk young people away from recruitment into violent extremism. I mean, the conventional wisdom is kind of the opposite almost, right? The idea that technology tends to you know, cocoon people into their tribes, and, 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 you, and you guys take issue yeah, with but that. I think, I think people are just making that up. I mean, the evidence so far is that people who use the internet um, spend a lot of time learning new things on it. And um, it's, I'm sure that the difference between sitting in your madras with this guy pounding this information into you, it just doesn't make sense to me that people would, would use the internet in the same way. The internet is, is always interesting. It's always colorful. People are naturally curious. People get distracted. They learn something new. Mm -hmm. The issues are called in question. A sort of core belief we have is that the internet allows people to see choices and to understand that there's another way of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, people will say, oh, you know, what's happening is there's this thing called a filter bubble and everything is becoming narrow and so forth. I think the, one, the data doesn't support that, and two, that those arguments do not apply to terrorists who are sitting in madrasas. Mm -hmm. so, so to me, the core argument is, what are you going to do with somebody who's being prostatized? Well, connect them to the internet. Okay. The, um, I think you, you go beyond kind of expecting the online world to be healthful in this sense. You're, you're, you talk about an actual kind of proactive effort, I guess, from NGOs or something to uh, the discussion of you know certain kinds of apps or something that that yeah. that might be preemptively useful. Can you talk about that well, a little? Think about it this way: so it's always been the case that the number of people in the world that are against violent extremism has vastly outnumbered that small, albeit very loud, minority that's in favor of it. Uh, but for the first time, if everybody has mobile phones, there's actually something that they can potentially do about it, and that could be as simple as speaking out. Uh, but if you look at the environments that are coming online, those are environments that one could build apps for that touch on education, that touch on health, that touch on a lot of the very basic uh, social and political grievances that drive people into situations where they might end up in a violent extremist group. Now, again, it's important to say we're not arguing technology is a, a panacea for uh, you know, combating violent extremism, but we're arguing that it gives us an in into communities that never existed before. And it also creates an opportunity for those that have made the decision to become violent extremists to be, you know, essentially on the grid whether they want to be or not. And, and there's one of the sort of arguments we make in the book is that it's essentially impossible to be off the grid. Um, so an example would be that if you're looking for somebody who's trying to evade government and the police for whatever set of reasons, a newly built house that has no internet connection uh, in an expensive neighborhood might be 
in fact, no connectivity whatsoever, might be an indication that maybe something's going on there that they, they don't want people to know about. This is the case of Osama bin Laden, of course. Um, if you take a look at in Boston, right, the two, the two young evil men, um, in fact, were tracked down using a whole bunch of technological solutions, including extremely good police work, and people make mistakes. So it may very well be. One of the questions to ask about these things is, why do they not occur more often given that there's more than two evil people in the United States. This must be you know, a couple more, right? And the answer, of course, when you talk to the police, is that they're constantly foiling uh, prototypical plots, you know, crazy people with too many guns and bombs mm -hmm. and so forth, and you read about them. Because of the nature of the technology, it's easier to find these people if you're the police and, and foil this ahead of time. So we would argue that the connectivity, while certainly empowering the knowledge revolution, also allows the legitimate police to go and stop these things before they happen. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, let me try out on you an argument about a connection between technology and terrorism that you don't entertain in the book, but uh, that I'm kind of persuaded by. Um, so there was a pretty much discussed article in The Guardian um, after the Boston bombings by Glenn Greenwald, where he noted that pretty much all the prominent homegrown terrorists and would-be uh, homegrown terrorists um, cite uh, aspects of American foreign policy um, as, as causal or as, as motivating. Um, you know, troops in Muslim countries, civilian casualties in drone strikes, um, and so on. And it, it does seem to me that this, this reflects uh, something that has changed in the technological environment. I mean, if you go back to, say, Vietnam, you know, remember the My Lai massacre, OK? Uh, first of all, it was probably rare that things like that even came to light. The world just wasn't nearly as transparent. Secondly, there was no danger that anything, you know, that anyone was going to mobilize. You know, there were people who hated America, but but it wasn't the case that it was easy for a relatively small number of them to recruit online, to organize online, and even to reach into America and and uh, you know and and encourage and convince people to commit terrorism. So it, it does seem like blowback from American foreign policy is, for technological reasons, arguably, uh, a bigger risk than it, than it used to be. But, that it's, it, but your argument is not necessarily a causal argument. There are plenty of countries that have terrorism problems which don't have foreign policies at all. Right. But, but, there, but they, then there are other grievances. Um, I, I mean, but, but there are, and I'm, I might say, I, I, don't, I, I don't. I want to be clear that my view is that if you randomly kill innocent people, you're just making something up, right, as to your reason. You're just Ill, Ill evil, and insane, right? Let's start from that premise. Well, there must be, you don't think there's anything causal at all? Well, I think, I think I, that's, a, that's a much broader question than the book. But it just seems to me that, uh, that there are, in fact, people who are sort of criminally insane, do not appreciate that they're not actually uh, achieving the objective, they can't think things through. This is why we have prisons. I, th I think it's a very dangerous uh, and dangerously prescriptive argument to suggest that people join violent extremist groups strictly because of foreign policy. I believe that grievances around foreign policy can exacerbate existing grievances. I believe that it serves as a justifying excuse, but I've spent time uh, interviewing a, a, a broad range of uh, violent extremists, both current and former. I've interviewed a number of gang members. I've interviewed, you know, various white supremacist uh, 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 members, and they all join for very similar reasons. It's a lack of belonging, a lack of status, some kind of you know, humiliation or alienation, and then I believe that chance matters a lot. Who do you happen to meet by chance on the street? Who do you go to school with? Do you live next to this mosque, or do you live next to this street corner? Um, and, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, no, your life is in shambles because of something related to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, not because of something that, that's more directly related to your actions or your family's mm -hmm. actions, that's a much more powerful cause to adopt. And so I believe it eventually becomes about that. But at its core, these are, these are more broken souls with dangerous toys than they are politically motivated violence. Yeah, and I should emphasize that this argument is not inconsistent with your diagnosis, that it's often about disaffection people who have become unstable or going off the rails for some reason. The question is kind of how, what sort of outlet does that find? And the more compelling a narrative you allow the, the recruiters to, you know, to construct, the more likely it is to, to, be, uh, to, to be terrorism. Um, let, me, um, let me ask you about a, a, a sentence um, to get back to the, uh, the question of the, the lives of people like this in the future online world. This is, this is a very kind of... Uh, uh, powerful sentence that I think merits unpacking. 
The shift from having one's identity shaped offline and projected online to an identity that is fashioned online and experienced offline will have implications for citizens, states, and companies. What, can you flesh that out? We, we make a, a sort of core argument that there's sort of two different kinds of societies. There's the physical world, which we're all obviously familiar with. We're all citizens of countries. There's police and laws and so forth. And there's also cyberspace. In cyberspace, you'll have, by our account, multiple identities, multiple names, multiple so forth. And for various reasons, you probably have more than one. Um, and the identity that you have there will also be constrained by the physical world. So for example, if you start doing things which are cl completely illegal and inappropriate in cyberspace, somebody in the physical world is going to come visit you because they're going to get a subpoena, get your IP address. Similarly, if you're in the physical world and you're a terrible dictator and you're busy doing terrible things to your citizen, people in cyberspace will use that to put enormous pressure on you to accuse you of genocide and sort of hurting your people and all that and provoke an international reaction. The two have slightly different rules and they keep each other in check. But of course, there's a lighter side of this too. If we accept the fact that with five billion new people coming online in the next decade, every individual in the world will increasingly split their time between the physical and, and the digital environments. Think about all the people in the world who, for a variety of reasons, have lost the opportunity to function in a physical world. The internet gives them a second chance. And let me give uh, what I think for both of us we would agree is the most powerful example of this, which is we were in uh, Pakistan and uh, met a group of women who had acid thrown on their faces by the Taliban. It's the worst thing that probably either of us have, have, have ever seen. And through no fault of their own, as a result of local norms, women who bear physical scars on their face as a result of such an atrocity uh, uh, have to live with a stigma in the physical world that essentially doesn't allow them to work, doesn't allow them to get married, essentially does not allow them to function in society in any meaningful way. So they all lived in this house together and they were being trained in entrepreneurship. Uh, they'd become reasonably tech savvy, they had smartphones, and they were able to essentially have a second life, uh, no pun intended, online. Uh, they were running businesses. One of them met somebody and eventually was able to get married because the internet knows no scars. Uh, the internet gave them an opportunity to function in society based on the merits of what they were doing and saying. And that's an extraordinarily powerful thing. Okay. Um, this would, conversation wouldn't be complete without some reference to Google Glass, I would say. You exercise admirable restraint in the book. You know, a, a, a great opportunity to promote Google Glass. You don't mention it that much. So I'm going to kind of force it into the conversation um, through uh, reference to a couple of recent things. Um, one I would call favorable publicity, one less so. The favorable, uh, Robert Scoble, um, well-known tech writer with, with, uh, who is highly respected, says, I will never live, he's tried it, you know, and he says, I will never live a day of my life from now on without it. Uh, or a competitor, he says, so you will, you will want to keep the updates coming, I guess. Um, and then, on the other hand, from the, the Daily Mail in Britain, which is, you know, doesn't shy away from dramatic uh, and some would say sensationalistic headlines. <laughs> Google's sinister glasses will turn the whole world into search giants spies. Um, now, would you like to either confirm or deny that, for starters? <laughs> um, or, or uh, actually, the, the, the question I kind of have, well, the, go ahead, or just The Daily Mail is always, did they, in fact, get a copy of Google Glass to write that review, or did they just sort of write if it? If you're familiar with British journalism, you know that the answer is that was not necessary. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but, but the question is, you know, you've talked, I think you've talked about the, the creepiness line or something, the, the, the idea that, you know, there, there's this, this vague place where things just get too creepy, and a company shouldn't go there. It's probably not in the company's interest to go there. It, it goes up to that point naturally enough, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, in the context of, of privacy and, and, and all these other issues, um, are there things with Google Glass that you're choosing not to operationalize to keep it from getting too creepy, or are you just going to let it go? Well, we're acutely aware of these sort of questions, and um, so I have a copy of Google Glass. Um, and it's a phenomenal product. Uh, the way it works is it, it uh, for somebody with glasses, it fits over your current glasses, and they'll fix that over time. But if you don't have glasses, it's just normal glasses looking. And um, there's a screen up here in your upper right-hand corner, and you can look up, and you can actually see the equivalent of a full screen. Um, and you talk to the Google Glass. So you say, hello, you know, basically, hello, Google Glass. 
and it will respond back. So it's a, not only a triumph of technical engineering at the hardware level, but it's also a, a good proof point of how good our voice recognition software is and our voice synthesis software, because there's no other way to talk, you know, to, to program the thing. So it'll do things like, you know, take photographs, it will, you know, show you videos, and it will answer your questions. The people are particularly excited about the fact that it's an, essentially an Android-based platform, as, is, as should everything be, right? And um, so this particular variant of this platform is extensible. And so we have a developer program, and starting about a week ago, we started to give these copies out, which is how Robert got his, and a few others. These were the early Google I.O. users. Um, and what we've told them is that we want them to build applications and we want to see what kind of apps they build. And the sum of all of that will then guide what we do. You know, how, do how, how do we bring the product forward? So at the moment, uh, I would say that this is an extraordinary technological leap. Um, it's fascinating to use. Um, there are obvious issues, right, mm -hmm. which anybody can, in the room can think about. Um, and I would also further argue that, that as these things become general, bo sort of body wearable computers, th there'll be a new social etiquette. You know, w when is it appropriate to, to have these things on and off, um, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. but so the answer to your question is, we're going to see how the next some months goes. We see how people really use it. It's too new a thing to call a question. Uh, I do find the people who announce with the same kind of headlines as the Daily Mail that this stuff should be banned. Um, innovation is all about trying to invent new things. Let's allow the innovation to actually be used a little bit before you attack it. America is all about innovation. It is the salvation of our economy, guys. Okay. Have you, have you tried Google Glass? I have. And of course, I always think of things through the, the geopolitical lens. And for some reason, I, uh, when I tried it, found myself thinking about wearables in Saudi Arabia. Go figure. Um, and you know, it, it's interesting. When you, when you think about Google Glass, you also can think about watches. You can think about various types of uh, shoes, uh, shoes var various types of, of smart wearables. In Saudi Arabia, the Mohabharat uh, basically spend all day in, in uh, you know, very noticeable outfits trying to follow women around to catch them doing, quote, un-Islamic things. And, uh, and punishing them as a result. It's a, it's a tragic story of, of, uh, of, of what's playing out there gender-wise. But you can imagine in the future, uh, Saudi women having wearable watches that look like normal watches that have an anti mohabharat app that functions much like Uber in the sense that uh, with Uber, you can watch the taxis sort of approaching you. So the women in You've Saudi- You've been using Uber too long, Jared. It's very, I like Uber, by the way. I find it very <laughs> useful. Um, so you can imagine you know, that women would be able to look at their watches and see where the mohabharat are and where they're moving, and when one is close by, they can send a pulse to somebody uh, nearby to let them know you better sort of kind of know. a heads up. Yeah. And in a more serious example, when we were in, I think in, it's serious. <laughs> you, you you agreed with me that it was. Serious. I do agree. I do agree. I like your idea. I think, I think we should more serious. Example. And an yeah. even more serious example. There we go. How about how about that? When we were in Libya, we met with a set of school children who had used Google Maps to plot the locations of the NATO bombings because they figured that's where the bombings would be so they can get themselves to school and not get killed. So you sit there and you wonder, how important are these technologies? Well, and somebody like using Saudi Arabia as an example, it's incredibly important. Can I give an even more serious one? Of course. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, were, we were in Iraq and Afghanistan where you have huge IED problems. And the problem with IEDs is it's essentially a game of whack-a-mole for devices that don't cost very much to make. And there's very little being done to address the supply. So you can imagine a situation where people in the village who are trying to avoid these, they know where people are placing them. And so they avoid a particular bridge or they avoid a particular location. So you can imagine uh, wearable devices being used to also plot and track uh, where IEDs are being laid so that way people in the village can warn each other. Let's say you see somebody in the distance who's walking near one. Maybe they don't uh, have access to the same screen that you do, but they have a device. You can send them sort of an alarm pulse saying, no, don't walk in that direction. Well, you know, David Brennan, in his book, The Transparent Society, many years ago, talked about, I think, people with, you know, cameras mounted on their, on their hats or something and noted that, that if you're somebody who wants to commit a crime against somebody, that is a real deterrent. Um, and if you imagine a world in which, you know, for all you know, anyone has Google Glass, or maybe anyone with glasses has Google Glass, or, or, or someday presumably contact lenses, right? So, so for all you know, anyone has it. I guess but no as one... I, but as I said, the, the, we're now in the realm of speculation. Uh, we don't know how society will respond to the, all of these kinds of technologies. 
Uh, I can tell you that uh, many, many American citizens are happy that the police now have police cameras in the cars mm -hmm. recording the traffic stops. It's protection for the citizen, it's protection for the police. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's an example where it's a net win for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and by the way, one more thing on Google Glass. You know, Eric, I think a, a few years ago I heard you on the radio getting supervisionary. As I recall, there was some reference to someday when you might have, you know, where Google or some other search functionality might directly interface with your brain. I don't think you were advocating it necessarily, but let me, let me just... That was actually a joke. Oh, okay. okay. Well, it, but it shouldn't be, but it shouldn't be, you know. Uh, we're, 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 we may be closer than you realize, according to the New York Times. You know, Samsung is working on this, this thing. You know, people put this thing on their head. It'll have electrodes, and they will be able to control their tablets. This by is a thinking. really stylish look. Electrodes coming it, out of your head it looks like as you're walking down the streets you, of You would look better if you had actual hair curlers in your hair, I would say, than you look in, in the thing if you've seen the picture. Um, but anyway, the Times wrote that you could, in principle, hook that up to Google Glass so that, you know, your commands are that, actually that, given via thought. That's version two. That's version two. You're ready. You're, you've already got that, that on That was that. a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> okay. Bob, you could imagine, again, I, I like the idea of ending on a positive note with glass. You, you, you could imagine a scenario in environments where uh, young people are not allowed to go to school by their, by their parents because they have to work in the field or you know, work at home. This is a, a constant problem. You could imagine in that scenario, those children working in the fields or working at their parents' store wearing Google Glass and absorbing content uh, as part of a multitask education and work exercise. Obviously not as optimal as going to school first time, but this fits the theme of our book, which is in the future, despite all the challenges, with more technology, people have more options and more choices. I think the trend, again, the general answer to Google Glass and these others is that people have an enormous thirst for information and entertainment, um, and that all of these technologies will, will be driven by consumer demand for that. And I think that's roughly a summary of what, of what much of what we'll see. People also want to be more productive, right? They want, they want this infinitely intelligent assistant and so forth. And to the degree that you can combine all those in new products and services, our industry will move very much forward. OK. So back to uh, the world abroad. You talk a lot about revolutions. I mean, we're all familiar with the Arab Spring. Um, and your sense is that, partly for technological reasons, it is going to be easier and easier to start revolutions, right? But then. What happens next? Well, we say that it's easier to start, but harder to finish. Right. So Jerry has looked at this, and he makes the point now over and over again that it takes decades for people to develop the skills, the human skills, the leadership skills, to, uh, to actually run a country, right? These are complicated you know, human systems. And so the techno-optimist would say, oh, you know, let's empower everyone, leaders emerge, and everyone will, you know, will all, it's kumbaya moment. In practice, what happens is sort of the inverse. You end up with the, the apparent nature of a revolution, along with a lot of increases of expectation. You have transitional lead leaders who are facing an almost impossible job. They don't have systems of government. And they have very high expectations of their citizens while we're trying to find the, the leaders that have spent the time to learn how to lead, how to inspire, you know, all the things that we expect out of a modern leader. And we, we talk a lot in the book about uh, you know, how these revolutions will play out outside of the Middle East and North Africa. And we made it, this was all happening so fast while we were writing this book that we made the decision on, on the, in the chapter on future of revolutions to start with a statement, we know the story of the Arab Spring. The, you know, let's look at what happens next and in other parts of, of, of the world. And to add to Eric's point about the, 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 the challenges of how technology for all that's extraordinary about it, can't invent leaders that aren't there and can't create institutions that have never been uh, developed. Um, if you think about the 57% of the world's population that lives under an autocracy, uh, what, that what those populations will have an ability to do in the future is to provoke in ways that we've never seen before. And the way to think about this is let's take a country like Iran. Iran is 72 million people, clearly a dictatorship. Uh, in the physical world in the future, there'll still be roughly 72 million people, but there might be 500 million voices online because every one of them will have multiple emails, multiple social networking profiles, multiple uh, you know, video chat uh, services, et cetera. And this creates a lot of noise and a lot of activity. So why does this create a dilemma for dictators in the future, which, by the way, is a good thing? Um, it creates a dilemma because dictators in the future are going to have a hard time distinguishing between what's noise 
and what's real. And they're going to overreact, they're going to underreact, yeah. and where they do so, it's going to get people into the streets. No, but it's very hard to tell whether you're dealing with a social movement of a million people or three guys, Tom, Dick, and Harry, who are just really good at marketing themselves right, in the virtual world. So here you are, and you're this befuddled dictator, and you're not quite sure, because if you go and you actually attack these three or a, th or a million, you're not quite mm -hmm. sure, you might actually cause the whole thing to happen, because now they've got mm -hmm. martyrs, and off they go. So, so this distinction between the physical nature, the kinetic nature of the world, right. versus the online world, makes it almost impossible to understand what the truth is if you're trying to have a command and control right. economy. And, and going back to our, our theme of choices and options, uh, we, we, we don't love the term cyber dissident because it gets thrown around all the time. And our view is if somebody's a dissident, that implies uh, taking a physical risk. But what you have in the future is the option for individuals to be virtually courageous in support of those people who are dissidents on the street taking risks. And so you have the ability to be an activist on your lunch break. You have the ability to be an activist online, but not a dissident in, in the street. And so it gives more people and more citizens under autocracies an opportunity to play a role. And that collective action mm -hmm. is what's missing in today's world where people are not yet connected. Mm -hmm. And Eric, you alluded to something that I found interesting um, in the book. You know, we think of the modern age as an age of growing transparency, where it's harder to keep you know, any, anything unknown. But you note that in the virtual world, when it comes to things like cyber attacks, locating the origin of the attack is often very hard. And you know, in the, in the realm of kind of things that have appeared in the news that more or less fulfill prophecies in the book since the book went to press, you've probably thought of this Syrian electronic army thing where somebody supposedly in the name of you know, pro-Syrian government grassroots uh, sentiment is, is, you know, hacking Twitter feeds, whatever they're doing. Um, some people say, no, no, it's, it's the Syrian government. Um, actually, for all we know, it's a false flag operation. It's Al Qaeda. I you mean, who knows, you, right? You, you just don't know. And you, there are many, many interesting thought experiments. Um, so we know, for example, with respect to cyber attack, and Jared makes the argument, by the way, that um, it's perfectly possible that you can have two countries that have good physical relations actually having mutual cyber war between the two, attacking each other. It's called espionage, right? We have had that for years in society. It's just a different form of it. So imagine a scenario where um, you have a, some form of a cyber attack which leaks into a physical attack. In other words, somebody makes a mistake. And this could occur, and this is obviously speculation. So let's say somebody gets hurt because somebody was screwing around with something and it sort of got out of, out of control. Um, and all fingers point to China because they're the, the guilty party in today's you know, zeitgeist, according to who to the US say. So now what happens is the US is trying to decide whether this is an act of war and whether they should retaliate. So the president of China calls up and says, sorry, we didn't do it. We're actually not guilty this time, and I'm telling you the truth this time, <laughs> as opposed to the previous conversations. Um, how do we know? Because a proxy setup can be done that a third party can create the impression that it was China, even though they're in fact not guilty this one time. And is this, is this mainly a short-term problem? And, and kind of in the long run, we usually find out. I mean, we kind of know who did Stuxnet. The New York Times knows that the attacks came from China and so on. Is it a short-term problem or, a, or an enduring problem? With um, it, it, All of these things are races between one group and another. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very hard to very well to very well cover your tracks. When Google was attacked, uh, we were able to figure out that it was the Chinese government or government-sponsored activities through a series of very, very subtle ways to find out how they had masked themselves. So it's probable that you could figure it out, but only with a lot of work, mm -hmm. right? And, and so it would, there would be a delay where you'd actually figure out who really did it. It's technically possible to fully mask where you come from. And there, there's two other points that, that, that are particularly alarming about the, the, the nature of cyber warfare or cyber terrorism and the direction that, that, that it's going. Uh, we've seen a lot of different versions of cyber attacks, a lot of uh, gradual escalations of cyber attacks. What we still don't know is at what point does a cyber attack become so problematic that it results in a physical world response? For instance, could you imagine a drone strike against a cyber terrorist if you had evidence that that cyber terrorist was preparing to do something particularly destructive and had a track record of doing so. And, and we should be clear that, that these, this sort of leaking into the physical space, they're called SCADA attacks, S-C-A-D-A. 
Um, and it's where the boundary between the internet transfers to something that we are, that's life critical for us. The electric power grid, the water system, uh, or a more likely scenario, something involving banking or financial, those kinds of systems. Uh, we talk about it in the book, but I also want to say before we scare people too much, that people are working very, very hard to fix these problems and fix these vulnerabilities. So it's not like this is, this is, an, uh, this is not necessarily a likely scenario, it's a possible scenario. And I'll say one more scary thing and then make a positive point as well, uh, just to keep the trend going. Um, we talk a lot uh, about coordinated physical attacks uh, in one conversation with one type of expert. And then we talk a lot about what uh, people in the, the technology sector describe as a cyber or Pearl Harbor. And these are isolated conversations, but you know, the real coordination we should fear is a cyber attack that makes it easier to conduct a physical attack. And, and, and that's, that's sort of the, 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 the future nightmare scenario. The good news is that, yes, in the future, it might be easier for uh, an individual to be involved in low-grade mischief or, or low-grade uh, uh, cyber attacking. But to do the, the caliber of attack that we're describing requires the types of coordination and planning that terrorists in the future will have to use the internet and have to be connected to, to do. And you know, we believe that it's going to be very hard to go through all the steps without at some point making a mistake or somebody in the network making a mistake. And the example, one, one example we, 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 we like to pull on, we had an interview with uh, a, a group of Navy SEALs uh, about a senior Al-Qaeda commander in Pakistan uh, that they'd been following for a number of years and then lost track of. He'd been very good about discarding phones, discarding um, uh, SIM cards, and then one day he popped up again. Uh, because he had a 45-minute conversation with the same phone using the same SIM card with his cousin in Afghanistan to tell him how excited he was to attend his wedding. So he had been careful professionally but screwed up socially, and that unraveled the whole plot. By the way, he was 26 years old. Younger than both of us. Don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> um. The, uh, I mean, the reason I ask about uh, the, you know, the ability to ultimately trace these things is, you know, this is, it's pretty scary stuff. I mean, you're, you're right that maybe the, the worst thing is a cyber attack that paves the way for a physical attack. But with Stuxnet, when you start, you know, you're doing physical stuff inside a nuclear processing facility. You, you can imagine a cyber attack that by itself does some pretty bad stuff. So I wonder about the prospects of a, of a treaty. Uh, and, and it seems to me it hinges very much on the question of whether there is, there is at least in the long run, accountability. You would need a verify, in order to have a proper functioning treaty, you'd have to have verifiability. Right. That's the core aspect of all of the nuclear treaties is that there's a mechanism, the IEA in uh, Vienna, Austria, which I in fact visited at Jared's suggestion, um, actually exists for precisely this purpose. It's unclear to me how you'd structure that today, but we can be hopeful that you would be able to. Of course, you could imagine the equivalent of NATO for cyberspace, that there's a certain caliber of cyber attack that uh, signatories agree is so destructive to critical infrastructure that if one nation is attacked, all the nations involved in this cyber NATO uh, would, would agree to you know, do something. Well, in general, it, it's, it's interesting the way you, you talk about the possibility of, uh, of kind of uh, multi-state groups with a common interest coalescing in cyberspace uh, for purposes of doing stuff on, on cyberspace. And, you know, good guys, bad guys, well, authoritarian well, governments. We, we have lots of examples. Um, we talk a little bit about the diaspora. And uh, a lot of the world is organized around diasporas. You know, the, this group over here was displaced 100 years ago. They have common language and history and so forth. We worry, by the way, that this will, is one of the things that will lead to balkanization. Uh, but we also recognize that that diaspora provides connectivity, wealth, transfer, culture, and protection you know, of the history in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. OK, I, I, we're going to go to questions uh, from the audience. Um, I, I want to ask a final thing very, very much um, related to this. Uh, in terms of uh, ethnic minorities, there, there's, there's, there's something hopeful and something scary in the book. The um, scary thing has to do with what you could call virtual apartheid. Uh, the idea that, okay, maybe you're not repressing groups in the physical world as you traditionally might, but you, you do things to, to disenfranchise or disempower them in, in the cyber world. Flip side is, is virtual statehood, where you imagine, you ima I think you imagine the Kurds uh, using cyberspace to, uh, you know, to realize some 
some approximation of uh, nationalist aspirations, which could, could be a positive thing depending on how it played out. You want to just talk about that a little and then we'll go to the audience? Yeah, well, when we, uh, Eric, Eric mentioned the, the, the balkanization of, of the internet as one possible, possible challenge, but one thing as you mentioned that we also touch on in the book is in, in the future, and this is a good thing by the way, uh, it's going to be impossible for bad regimes to attack their people in the physical world uh, without the world seeing. It doesn't mean they won't still do it, uh, but everything will be caught on camera and be fed into data permanence uh, uh, re regardless. Uh, so while some dictators may still crack heads in the physical world, other dictators may decide it's not worth uh, paying the international price for this. And, so you and by the way, I would say that the oversight, the, the sort of fact that these things are being recorded is a significant sort of reason why people will be a little bit less deadly, right? Because they know that we can start the trial, the war crimes trial, while they're still killing people. And, and we do fundamentally, by the way, believe there's less autocrats in the world willing to do it with the world watching than there are uh, with the world not watching. So the, 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 the sort of plan B uh, for some of these dictators in the future, when everybody's connected, is you can imagine them slowing down the internet connection of a particular group, possibly cutting them off. Uh, every time they try to do a financial payment, it shows up as fraud, DDoS attacks, malware, all these things, and it make it look like technical difficulties. Now the challenge of this is it's incredibly disruptive to these people's lives, and it's not going to evoke the same emotional reaction from the world, especially when they make it look like technical difficulties. Now the flip side of this is again going back to the theme of more options, uh, more choices. Presumably, uh, you know, different ethnic, religious, and other minority groups will have more ways and more people helping them. So in the book, we talk about transnational meddlers. Uh, these are altruistic people around the world who, in cyberspace, choose to take up the plight of a particular group that's being discriminated against. And there's lots of people who want to help and lots of people who can't help. Okay. All right. Uh, we're ready to take questions. We have a couple of circulating microphones, I think. So I guess we'll start right here. Stein, my question for Eric. Uh, what was the division of labor uh, on the book? Uh, the Guardian recently had a review of the book, and it was basically a positive uh, uh, review. But then when it hypothesized it has some negative things, it suggested that there were interns that were working on the book, and they did a substantial part. It said, each chapter goes into relentless, almost mind-numbing detail, which leads one to guess that the first drafts were the product of teams of those smart, endlessly obliging Ivy League interns who are filling in time before becoming Fulbright or Rhodes Scholars, and then it develops that, and every time it doesn't like something. this conversation we had earlier about in the British press? <laughs> okay, the people who wrote this book were Jared, me, and my daughter Sophie, who's not an intern, and well credited in the book. Is that a clear answer? Yeah. Okay. We also use Google Docs, and we travel to 30 plus countries. Um, and, and so the way we actually wrote it is that we use Google Docs. And if you haven't used it, it's a phenomenal way to write a book. <laughs> uh, because basically, we would just sit there and have conversations. And I would be editing, and he'd be editing at the same time. It didn't matter where we were. We would often do this next to each other, yelling at each other as we were typing. Sometimes um, throwing things, but. and. Um, so anyway, I can say enough things about Google Docs. So I hope that's a clear answer, and I found their comments sort of offensive, because they just made it up. And you know, if you're going to write a review, don't make stuff up. Mm -hmm. Hi. I, I taught school for 30 years, and I got out just at the point at which technology was beginning to truly make an impact, which meant that the kids knew more than the teachers do. And that's probably true today to an even greater extent. Let me ask you this. Do you see the school's responsibility in terms of dispensing access to information, knowing that kids have these things at home, and they're going to look at stuff anyway? Do you see that as expanding or contracting? Do you, and do you see, do you, do you understand what I'm getting at? Should they draw, draw the line lower or higher with respect to allowing kids within their institutions to access information. Let's say a kid wants to look up or do research on Al Jazeera. That might, in some communities, get that kid into some trouble. You know, because they've, you know, their, their philosophy is to let you know what the other side's thinking. I, I don't want to minimize the issues of terrorism, but we're talking about education in general, right? And the role of the teacher becomes more important when there's infinite information 
not less. So you would conclude from reading our book that we believe that teachers, and in particular human teachers and judgment, are more important in the presence of all this information, and that we are delighted that all of this tools and techniques and so forth will get there. But the best scenario by far is an empowered teacher, an excited student, and an infinite amount of information. I don't think you'll find an argument, any argument counter to that from our perspective. OK, the woman in black right there in the aisle seat. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, it's a really interesting talk, and I look forward to reading your book. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is about um, information processing. So obviously, with all this technology and the access to information that it brings, there's a lot of information out there. And so there's a real question about who processes that information and how they do it. So with the Boston bombings, as you probably know, on Reddit, there was a lot going on. A bunch of people, um, one of whom turned out to actually um, have been dead, um, were accused um, within these forums of being responsible for the bombings. So the first question is, so how do we think about information processing, and how does that affect how we think about the limits of technology? Um, and then the second question um, is about Google Ideas. So um, I've been fascinated by your organization. Well, for let's, do, let's do one at a time. OK. Um, the, on the first one, I think, um, everybody remember Richard Jewell in the Olympics? Right, this poor fellow was, was terribly maligned by the traditional media. So this notion of a rush to judgment is not a new concept. We saw it in this you know, horrific bombing. Um, and I w when I look at what happened in Boston, I see it as an almost perfect example of how the online community and the police should work together. The police worked very quickly and under enormous pressure to identify videotapes, which they released to the public. At the point at which the videotapes were released to the public, the, the, the speculation, which was sort of random and interesting, right, which is based on crowdsourcing, had some facts. And with those facts, uh, within an hour or two, and if you go through the sequence, the, the, two, the two bombers um, freaked out, uh, went, and they eventually do a carjacking. They take this poor guy, drive him around for an hour and a half. Uh, he escapes and cleverly, or because he's terrified, leaves his cell phone in the car. And the police then, using that information, track the car, which ultimately leads to the death of one and the injury of the other who ends up in the boat and is now captured. So to me, it doesn't get much better than that in terms of responsiveness and everybody working together. What you learn about with the Reddit example, and this is true in general, is take a breath. right? Consider there's other choices. The internet is not perfectly accurate on an instantaneous basis. Uh, you saw this with the AP Twitter example where the way it worked was the, the, the trading machines were actually programmed to take the tweet and act on it without comparing. These are computers, by the way, not humans. Because a millisecond in that world is you know, billions of dollars of profits. Well, in this case, they failed to consider an alternative in their computer, and therefore they made a trade that was inappropriate. So the fact of the matter is that, that there's no substitute for human judgment, and human judgment does not occur in a millisecond. You have to actually look at it to think about it. And this problem is not going to go away, and hopefully we're going to learn to actually not jump on people within a second. Um, so quickly second about question. Google Ideas. Um, so as I said, a really interesting organization. But it's not easy to find a lot of information about what you guys do online. Um, and so I'd love to hear a little bit more, maybe you talk about it in the book, but a little bit more about what Google Ideas do, does um, and how the rest of the Google platform, particularly you know, all the technology you have that gathers all that information, feeds into what you do. Well, first of all, you can go to uh, google.com slash ideas. I, I have, but uh -huh. it's not, there isn't a lot of specific information. Um, and I, I want to, I'll, I'll give a, a quick answer because I want to I wanna give other people a chance to, to ask questions. But the, if you think about how technology companies uh, look, at, uh, look, look at the world, there's core business, there's philanthropy, and there's public policy. But if you think about the next 5 billion people coming online, uh, they live in environments where they encounter a set of challenges that don't fall neatly in any of those first three boxes. Uh, typically challenges related to, to, to violence. Uh, so Google Ideas looks to uh, build data visualization tools and actually visualize data uh, that uh, helps expose, map, and disrupt some of the illicit networks that are perpetuating that violence, you know, everything from pirate groups to, to uh, you know, organizations uh, distributing malware, et cetera. Um, and then we go out and build products that are designed to uh, help address them. Uh, we also just did a refresh of, of, of the site last week, so take a look at it again. Okay, in, uh, in the black and white horizontal stripes. 
Hi. Um, <laughs> in a world where here in DC we don't even get our cell phone coverage, um, how do you think um, we can get the infrastructure, given the political deadlock on even the infrastructure bank, uh, to realize your visions about even Google Glass or other uh, ideas that you have? Um, <clears throat> the reason your cell phone coverage doesn't work very well here is a combination of regulatory issues, a lack of competitive carriers, uh, et cetera. Um, I'm a member of a, the White House Science Group, and we actually released a, a proposal a year ago to solve this problem in a different way using technology, essentially the sharing of spectrum. So I think there are good technical solutions coming, and unfortunately they won't occur fast enough given the rate at which people are using uh, digital devices, laptops, and so forth. Your question is particularly appropriate because the, the adoption of these mobile devices is happening so much faster than everyone expected, and the networks are themselves not scaling. And there's great concern that the, in the United States that there's going to be a running out of bandwidth problem in aggregate in the next few years. People are working very hard on it. Um, the, uh, right, right there on the, on the aisle. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, um, so you, you talked at, at length about how um, modern technology, and particularly the increasingly, uh, increasingly wiring parts of the world are very advantageous to both terrorism and counterterrorism efforts, and at the same time, how innovation, uh, for example, the use of, use of uh, Google Maps to plot out uh, IED sites, um, you know, are, are helping people in, in parts of the world by, by innovating, using this technology to come together and better themselves. But taking that away from abroad and taking it into the United States, um, it seems like the, the laws here are rather antiquated when it comes to computer technology. I mean, and just this week, across the street, uh, a Senate committee just uh, approved a resolution to the Electronic Communications Privacy Act so that a warrant will actually be required to receive an email, or um, for investigators to get an email. And at the same time, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1984 is being um, called for reform by, by tons of people, especially in the wake of Aaron Schwartz. Now, when we're looking at trying to use technology in places, less modernized places across the world, in order to bring about change, what do you think needs to be done in the United States with com current computer laws in order to ensure that innovation isn't going to be stifled at home? Um, that's essentially a, a sort of Google public policy U.S. question. And the sort of the summary here is that in the book we don't talk too much about the specifics here because we take the position that in a well-functioning democracy, the democracies will sort of sort those issues out um, and that, that you may see a difference in one country for another. Um, I read a survey, for example, I'm not endorsing it, that 75% of Americans now support street cameras, right? Um, you can imagine the, the people who are opposed to this and their arguments and how that will play out. Um, we've had, okay, that's right. So, so the fact of the matter is, you, but, you, but my point is without, without going to specific policy prescriptions, I think you can see that one coming. You can see the arguments in favor and arguments against. And in a well-functioning democracy, which America certainly is, uh, with respect to a constitution and a rule of law and so forth, we'll sort it out. It's never perfect, as you pointed out. Many of the laws in the 80s and 90s that, uh, that were written did not anticipate the kind of mobility sort of in version three of all of that, but they're relatively easily dealt with. And, and I should also say that, that uh, when, when you come across an advocate for one thing, you know, an advocate for security or an advocate for privacy, they're often arguing from a position without understanding that it's a two-edged sword. So for example, very strong encryption would allow you and I to have a very, very secure communication if we were criminals, if we were dissidents, if we were martyrs, or if we were just doing normal business. So the question that you want to ask is, this very strong encryption has been, has been invented. Do you, can, if you could figure out a way to ban very strong encryption from evil people and only allow good people, and if there were sort of an E and a G on their foreheads, then this would be easy. But since we can't quite write the rule that way, it becomes a very difficult public policy thing to find that balance. Okay, we have time for one or two questions depending on how um, concise they are. Are you concise? Yes. Okay. Um, it's been a fascinating di uh, discussion. Oh, thanks. Um, I'm not sure about the conciseness. That was, was that strictly speaking absolutely um, necessary? We we have a very expensive <laughs> connectivity model in this country. Um, 
for reasons you've already alluded to in one of your answers. What are your thoughts on an open access model similar to our federal highway system where the federal government plans, manages, builds, and pays for it? Again, a very complicated question. Uh, today, the majority of wireless connectivity in America is on something called Wi-Fi. It's actually not on the 3G and 4G networks. Wi-Fi, as you know, does not roam, whereas the 3G and 4G networks roam. So that looks like so that's sort of fact number one. Um, the Obama administration is pushing hard for, and in, in the president's speech uh, late last year, for an additional some number of hundred of megahertz of frequency to be reallocated from what people like myself would say are poor or not very interesting uses to help solve this problem. And that's caught up in all sorts of debates. The FCC has taken a position in favor of it. So the, the problem we have at the moment is that the government has decided to sell spectrum rather than give it away. And by selling the spectrum, they've concluded that they have a valuable good. That then drives up the prices for us as citizens because it's a private sector purchase. So you could imagine other models. Uh, so for example, in, in many other countries which face the spectrum shortage, I've said to them privately and in fact publicly that don't go to the auction model because you're just raising the prices for in an economy which has a lot of very in inexpensive people. And the strategic value of getting everyone interconnected in terms of economic growth and taxes and so forth overwhelms any local specific money that you're going to make from these auctions. Uh, my, my personal intuition, which is not Google's position on this, um, Google doesn't really take a position on it, is that we're probably better off with many more generalized open access models for spectrum, taking some of the poorly used spectrum and, and reserving it for these new uses, and especially these share uses, and I think the sum of that could produce a huge explosion in spectrum. Okay, final concise question, right there. Hey, I'll talk fast. It goes back to your original argument that, thank you, about planting a seed of doubt that perhaps there's a causal relationship between disseminating information around the world and promoting democracy. But now, we do leadership training with young people around the world, including your favorite hotspots, Kyrgyzstan, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Egypt, et cetera. What we're seeing is you know, that bubble you have where you don't have leaders prepared when you do cause the revolution, you don't have the next generation prepared. We're working with that and creating these new leaders. But what we're hearing from them is their attraction to the old command and control economy that they see in China because what they're looking for is economic stability. I mean, that's the primary... Well, capitalism is inherently unstable. That's why it's called capitalism. It's the birth and death of other countries. Um, maybe you could ask a question. In this so context. the question is, do you really think that the free flow of information is going to ultimately result in democracies increasing around the world? Because kids are just as well hearing about China and what a great model it is. And China is actually having us do training bring leaders from around the world there for training. So, so let me answer your question with, uh, with an anecdote from a trip that we took to Myanmar, formerly known as, as Burma, about a month ago. So Myanmar has less than 1% of its population connected to, to the internet, extraordinarily low number. And until 18 months ago, it was a horrible dictatorship. And now it's a transition to something. And I'll reserve judgment about whether that's democracy or, or, or not. Um, Despite the fact that less than 1% of the population has access to the internet, everybody we met had heard of it. They understood what the internet was as a set of values, as an idea, and as a concept, even though they'd never experienced it as a user or as a tool. And their understanding of the internet was not the Chinese version of the internet, not the Iranian version of the internet. It was the internet that we know. So then go back to the 57% of the world's population we alluded to before that's living under an autocracy. As though, if you follow that same model, where the populations know what the internet is and understand it in a Western democratic context, what happens when they come online with expectations of an internet that looks like that and instead find themselves experiencing a filtered and censored internet? We, we don't know. So, so I would answer this by saying that uh, societies as a group will organize themselves around the needs of the middle class of that society. That uh, it will not be possible to be a completely brutal command and control dictator anymore. The only possible uh, counterexample of this will be North Korea, and we're working on that. We'll see what happens there. Uh, but aside from North Korea, I think it's pretty clear that the middle class, and the middle class will demand at least some amount of choice, economics, some variant of capitalism, some variant of trading with other partners, and so forth. So, so you won't be able as a dictator to have complete control of the society. If that's a step toward democracy, 
I'll take it. OK. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, are you going to stick around and sign yes, books? Yes, OK. So, so you can get books signed. Thank you. Uh, and um, and uh, I, I would encourage you to read the book, whether or not you get it signed. It's very rich. I could have uh, spent another couple of hours uh, asking you questions about really important stuff. Um, so thanks for writing. Okay, thanks. Thank you all.